right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. As we all uh, make our make our way to our seats, let's um, uh, let's come before the Lord in in prayer. Let's come before the Lord, our God, our Maker, who is righteous and just, who is our Comforter, our strong tower. Who is the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus? Let's come before our God, church. Um, so let's, uh, if you're able, let's stand together as we approach the throne room of grace together. Lord, we are here as your body. imperfect people, God, with our own struggles and our own inadequacies, different life situations. But God, you are truly faithful to each and every one of us, God. And I thank you that you are doing a work, a mighty work in our lives, Father. I pray that our hearts would, would be humble before you, God, as we approach as we worship, Lord, let it not be stale and let it not go through tradition and, and repetition as, as if these are just things and just customs and traditions to do on Sundays. But God, I pray that you have put in us the revelation that we are before the Lord God, our maker. So I pray, Father, that you would bring our hearts in alignment with your Holy Spirit today. Yeah, God, we just pray that you'd reveal the gospel even to our hearts. We just thank you for the precious, for your precious Holy Spirit here in this place. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If we're able, let's, um, let's just, I think Andy said last week, if, if you're able, let's just go and say hi to those around us. I know that we usually just say hi to those our seats, but if there's someone around you, let's just shake their hands. Let's say hello. Let's say that, let's just, let's just say that the Lord loves you. And we're glad to see you here.
How great, how great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living
worship to our God who has saved us.
Hello, YNLA. Uh, my name is Kevin. I am the current lead pastor for YNLA. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, whether online or in person, welcome. I welcome you. I hope and pray you will continue to journey with us as a faith community. Uh, let me just start with a few quick announcements uh, before we begin. First announcement, uh, we will have our monthly lunch today. However, uh, we're switching locations. Okay, We're, we're going to move to um, a very close by, like a, it's like a food court area with like um, a bunch of food trucks and other restaurants, and uh, there's a coffee shop there. Uh, we realize it's easier for people to kind of mingle and want to go here if it's really close. It's literally like walking distance from our church, um, but also you're kind of uh, free to buy whatever you want instead of, you know, being forced to have dim sum or things like that. So I thought this would be an easier place for uh, more people to come out, mingle with the community and get to know one another. Uh, so please do come out if you can. It'll be right after service. We're going to head over. That's the address right there. It's 2020 Barranca Street. Um, yeah, moving right along. Um, our monthly missions prayer meeting is this coming Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Zoom. Um, so this this month, we are actually going to be joined by our two new missionaries that are uh, going to that we're going to be praying for together as a community and supporting. Um, I'm not going to share them. They asked me not to share their names or where they're um, going to be because this is live and it'll be on YouTube and they kind of want to be a little bit uh, secretive about this stuff because they are in a more dangerous country. However, if you come out on Wednesday, you'll find out their names and which country they're from. So yeah. I guess that's a plug for getting to know them. Cool. Come out uh, on Wednesday night if you can. Um, next slide. Uh, we will be having a Super Bowl watch party next uh, Sunday after worship service ends. We'll be meeting in the College Chapel. Um, this is for signing up right here at this QR code. Um, if I, I believe it'll be a potluck. So if you want to bring something, if you want to share something with the rest of the community, please bring something. Um, and if not, then just come and have a good time and enjoy with us. Um, yeah, it'll be at 3 p.m. in the college room. Yeah. Ash Wednesday service. Uh, so this will be a joint worship with the KM side. So it'll be at the KM Sanctuary on February 14th at 7.30 p.m. Um, if you have no Valentine's Day plans, just come to worship, you know? A... <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, why not the FNF? So our Friday night fellowship will be on February 23rd this month. Um, here is the RSVP link. Um, we need this for a headcount for food as well as for whatever activity we're going to be having. So please do sign up if you can. 6.30 p.m. is when they have dinner, and then 7 p.m. will be the actual activity. So if you can make it, please do come. We would love to see you there and uh, you know, be a part of our community. Next slide. 
Uh, so there are various volunteer opportunities that we are still looking for. Um, we, we still need teachers for the youth ministries. We still need uh, college leaders. We need Awana teachers passionately. And YNLA also needs people uh, to serve on staff. Um, so please, if you're interested in serving in any of these capacities, let me or any of our staff know, and we'll point you in the right direction. OK, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. We'll get truck right along. Here we go. Lord God, we ask uh, for your discernment. We ask for your Holy Spirit as we continue to study your word together. Um, it's a difficult book, but I believe, God, that there are so many lessons that you have in store for us. So I pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to uh, open up our eyes and our hearts to receive um, whatever message it is that you have prepared for us. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Moving right along. Today we'll be going over Leviticus chapter 19 and 20. And there's quite a lot to cover because these two chapters are a little weird. Um, but before we jump in, let me just catch this up. Let's recap uh, some of the relevant information for today. So once again, chapters 1 through 16, mostly relating to priestly duties, mostly about um, the, the temple, right, and how the priests are supposed to moderate the, the presence of God to the rest of the Israelite people. It's called the peace source. Okay, and it was, it was the first part of Leviticus. The second part, right, chapter 17 through 26, chapter 27 is its own thing, so we'll go over that later, but chapter 17 to 26 is called the H source, the holiness source, because it's got its own vocabulary, it's got its own purpose. You see, from the 1 through 16, even though it's kind of centered on the temple and the priests, you get to the second half and the holiness source, they start to talk a lot about how the holy land is going to kick the Israelites out if all of the Israelites now do not follow the holiness code, right? And so there's this kind of important distinction between the, the way that the two halves work. Um, and because for the P tradition, the holy place, the holy space is only the temple, which means really most of the responsibility and blame is placed on the priests, right? They are the most important mediators of God's presence. And so it's kind of not super relevant to a lot of just people in general, the regular people. Um, but the second half here, now, because the promised land of Canaan has become holy, and the people must all live in certain ways in order not to be cast out of the land, the land is now the sacred space. It's expanded beyond the boundaries of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, right? And now the holiness has been put in the hands of the people, okay? And I hope everyone remembers, but the definition of holiness that we had uh, many sermons ago, to be holy means to be set apart. Okay? It means to be set apart, to be different, to be utterly unique from the people that are around us, okay? separated, distinct. Okay, we good? Holiness? Yes? All right. And we discussed how the values of the Israelites are holy. They are set apart. Right? What the Israelites treasure, what they value, are different from the way that the rest of the communities and nations around them uh, react with one another. So that's how we can also be holy, is when our beliefs, our values, our ideals, our perspectives are different from those around us. In this passage today, <clears throat> H is going to further develop this concept of holiness for the people. Because when you read chapters 19 and 20, it feels really random. Almost like all these commandments are just thrown together like last minute, and there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of connective tissue between all of them. But the one way that they are connected is through this concept of holiness, okay? So if you can turn to Leviticus chapter 19 for now, um, I hope we can further study this to better understand it. As I explained last week, H believes that the people of Israel now are responsible for the holiness of the land and their people. So although the priests continue to lead the people, right, it's not just the priests anymore. It's now all of Israel. Okay? Regular people can have access to the same holiness of Yahweh if they aspire to the ideals and the commands that H has outlined um, in these chapters. And this aspiration to holiness is carried over into the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. That's why in Matthew, Jesus quotes directly from Leviticus, and he charges the people of Israel to be holy, as the Lord your, your God is holy, right? That's in Matthew. Uh, therefore, we need to study these commandments. We need to understand them. We need to read them because they teach us how we as God's people today can also be holy, but because these commands were written a long time ago, 
right? The more removed we are from them, the more difficult it becomes for us to fully understand the intent behind them. So with that being said, now let's look at these commandments together. In Leviticus chapter 19, we're going to read one, verses 1 through 2. Or Actually, hold on. One, one, more, one more thing. Honestly, if we were going to try to go through every single one of these commandments in this chapter, um, it, it, we're going to be here for a really long time. We, we could spend months in just this chapter alone. Don't worry. I'm not going to do that. I'm trying to finish Leviticus before my son is born. I don't know if it's going to happen, um, but I am trying. Um, but... Instead, I'm going to try to give a general overview of how the chapter works and how we can use these kind of categories in order for us to better understand um, what it is to be holy in terms of our relationships with God and with other people today. So please be curious. You know, there's some weird things in there, right? Be curious. Ask questions. Like, look at it together, right? Um, I'm always down to talk about ancient Near Eastern history and, and culture and mythology if you want. Maybe just me, but anyway, whatever. As we read together, you're going to notice the repetition of this one phrase. So just keep this in mind. I am the Lord, or I am the Lord your God. This phrase has a lot of special significance and meaning, right? It's the same pattern. It's the same phrasing from Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 6. Okay, that's uh, when God gives the Ten Commandments. He establishes his covenant with Israel. He starts with this line, right? In essence, this is like a signature of God. It's a signature stating this is a command from God. Almost like, I, the Lord, have spoken this, or I, the Lord, have said this, right? That, this is kind of that's what that line is doing. And it, it comes up a lot in Leviticus uh, in the age source. So these laws in Leviticus, they do hold this kind of special significance and relevance. It's almost as if given by God himself. With that in mind, now let's read chapters 19, verses 1 through 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the Israelites, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is what Jesus quotes in the Sermon on the Mount from when I first started as the interim pastor here. Right, man, coming full circle. I did not plan it like this, but here, here we are. Right? Why is this passage important? Well, this is the motivation for the rest of the commands that are going to follow. The motivation for the Israelite to be holy is because the God that they serve is holy. This means that every single commandment given, there is some way that it reflects God's character or nature. Yes, even the mixed fabric stuff or don't shave your beard stuff in, in, in the Leviticus 1919, I believe. But the scholarship is all over the place, is broad, it's, it's really, there's a lot to read about this stuff. What I mean to say is I can sit here and talk about what every single one of those commandments mean, but we will be here for a long time, over two hours, nobody wants that. I don't want that either, okay? That's not my point, right? My point is that all these laws have a point, right? They're not random. Every single law is given for the purpose of being holy like the Lord your God is holy. And one of the categorizations that I found in my studies that have really helped me understand some of this stuff is the concept of negative and positive holiness. Negative and positive holiness. Let me explain. Let's look at chapter 19, verses 3 to 4 together. You shall each revere your mother and father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make cast images for yourself. yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Right? Here, there are two negative commandments and one positive holiness command. Okay? Negative holiness, it comes from Israel's separation, its distinction from the rest of the world. So right here, in this commandment, the command to keep the Sabbath, right, and the command to not make idols or graven images of God, these are ways that Israel distinguished itself, separated itself from the nations. So it is a negative holiness command. Because to the Israelites, especially to ancient worlds, keeping the Sabbath was a really weird thing to do. Taking a break at the end of the week was suicidal okay, for many of them because they're farmers. Most of these societies were agrarian societies, right? They depended on the harvest. And so taking an entire day off of work as a farmer back in those days could have meant death for many of them, right? Most ancient cultures, they had scheduled festival days for a break, right? Usually at the end of a harvest or something like that. Israel is the only ancient culture with a weekly break, right? Again, it was like you could die. You need, to, you need this food to, to feed your family. This is, this is not like, a, oh, I need to make profit. Like you, need, you need food, right? Um, and 
it's kind of crazy to, to do this. And this was a very like, separate, kind of distinctly Israelite thing to do. Why? Because God says this puts the trust in God at the top, right? It's no longer trust in the work of your hands. It's trust in God. Just take the day off. Worship the Lord and remember him and remember his favor, and he will take care of the rest. It's, it's scary, right? It's scary to think about. Um, and it's the same thing with the graven images and idols, right? All the other nations, they have graven images of their gods, right? Whether it's like a, a man, man's body with a crocodile head or whatever, right? Um, God's image, though, at least we, how we see it in Genesis chapter 1, God's image is mankind, as humanity. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. The, the word there in Hebrew is selem, it's the same um, image for idol. It's the same word, selem, right? So the idea is that because God has created mankind in, their, in his own image, you don't need a graven image to worship Yahweh, right? Because you have each other. Right? You're supposed to see the image of God in each other and love and respect each other in that way. This is a very distinctly Israelite thing to do. Right? They separated themselves from the other nations because they don't have idols of Yahweh. So you see kind of these, both of these commands, they are ways of negative separation. They're negative holiness right? because they separate Israel from all the other nations. However, the commandment to revere your father and mother, it's a positive holiness command. Right? Through a specific action or behavior or way of life, Israel is now supposed to imitate God's heart and character to the rest of the world. And one of the ways that they imitate God's heart is by honoring or revering their parents. There's, there's a whole like, fascinating discussion about this because like, in Exodus uh, chapter 20, when it comes out, it, it says the, on, the, the Hebrew word is uh, kavod, which means to honor. And then here in Leviticus, it says yare, which means to fear. So... I'm not going to get into that. Uh, anyway, the point still stands. Something about revering or honoring your parents, it echoes the heart and the character of God somehow. Okay? These categories are really helpful, especially when you come across commandments that are really weird, like, that you don't fully understand. Right? Um, and it also gives you this opportunity to get more deep, right? really dig deep into it. Let's read verses 9 through 10. <clears throat> when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. What does this mean? Like, is this positive or negative? In the historical context, Israelites, they're being commanded to not take every single crop, every single piece of profit for themselves. They're supposed to leave some of it at the edge of their field so that the poor, the marginalized, the outcasts, the aliens, the foreigners, they can come and eat, right? It's so that they can also survive. It's this act of mercy and compassion on the poor and the destitute that mirrors the heart of God. So in some sense, it is a positive holiness, right? It mirrors the heart of God for the poor. However, this command doesn't limit it to just poor people living in Israel. It also includes foreigners, and aliens. In fact, it's so important that this command is kind of reiterated. The heart of this command is reiterated in verses 32 to 34. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So when you look at this, it might seem like a positive holiness command, but it's also a negative holiness command because when you study ancient Near Eastern history, God's love for the alien or the foreigner is unique to Israel. Every other nation said, anyone outside of our nation, who cares? Screw those people. Babylon first, right? It was always like that. But for God, he says, no, you will love the alien and foreigners in your midst because they are also people created in the image of God, Right? So there's this distinctness in God's love for the alien and the foreigner, right? That all of his creation deserves respect, kindness, and love, right? Because all the other nations, they have concern for the poor. Of course they do, right? It's a very nice thing to do, but not for the aliens, not for foreigners. In this way, the more that we learn, the more that we understand, the deeper that our awareness of God's heart and character becomes. We're able to recognize more deeply the heart of God, right? 
But we also now see the value. There's a separation from the rest of the world around them. There's both positive and negative holiness. And some of these commands, they just look really strange, right? But understanding the category might help you to understand the meaning. For example, again, that I mentioned Leviticus 19.19, 19, right? There's this like forbidden mixing of animal species, of seeds and of fabric. Why? Well, even if you don't know the exact reason, you could deduce, right, that it's a type of negative holiness, that somehow these practices separate Israel from the rest of the neighbors, right? So even if you don't know exactly why, right, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it today because, again, we're going to be here forever. Even if you don't know exactly why, it tells you, you know, there's something distinct. There's something unique about the way that Israel does this, right? And all of this kind of culminates into the center of Leviticus, the center of the chapter, what many rabbis and Jewish scholars consider as the very heart of God's law. Because if you look at the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, right, the center of the Pentateuch is Leviticus. And at the center of Leviticus is Leviticus 19, verse 18, the very heart of God's law. But the, so many, many scholars call it the pinnacle, the climax of God's law. Um, let's read it together. Chapter, verses 17 through 18. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incru, incur guilt to yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. More specifically, the entire ethical summary of Scripture is in verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Like the word, therefore, but you shall love, here in this verse, is va ahavta, right? And the root word there is ahav, which means to love. But that word does not mean have nice feelings. It's not about having nice, bubbly, warm feelings for somebody, right? It's to act ethically toward. It's to do good for their sake. It means to do good as you would do that good for yourself. It's an ethical command for people to follow. It's to do these things. It is an action. It is primarily an action and not a feeling, right? For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 through 19, God says that the alien is loved by giving him food and shelter, not by having nice feelings toward him. God is loved when people observe his commandments. That's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 10, and chapter 7, verse 9. And God expresses his love toward Israel by doing something. He protects them from their enemies, and he blesses their land. He does something. The love is an action. To love your neighbor as yourself is the culmination of God's law. It is the most surefire way to live a holy life. And I believe that a lot of these holiness commands, they can be summed up summarized by this quote from Jewish philosopher uh, Martin um, Buber. I think that's how he says his name. Um, but here it is. God is the absolute authority over the world because he is separated from it and transcends it, but he is not withdrawn from it. Israel, in imitating God by being a holy nation, similarly must not withdraw from the world of the nations, but rather radiate a positive influence on them through every aspect of Jewish living. And so it's no wonder that in Luke 10, an expert of the law stands up and asks Jesus, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Rabbi, who is my neighbor? Right? This is not an attack on Jesus. This is a widely debated theological topic during Jesus' time for all the rabbis. This is the most important command, to love your neighbor as yourself. So, of course, who is my neighbor? Who counts as my neighbor? Right? And he wants to hear Jesus' opinion on it. Jesus' take. What is your take, Jesus? In the same way, chapter 20 holds some of the more severe violations of God's commands. Um, it has specific prohibitions against things like child sacrifice. Um, it repeats some of the sexual prohibitions from chapter 18. Um, but yeah, a lot of these things are from a very long time ago. Cursing your parents holds the death penalty, um, as does various types of incest or when men sleep with other men or intercourse with an animal, bestiality, like all of those things, right? It, it's a death penalty. But the most interesting part to me is toward the end of the chapter, verses 22 to 26 in chapter 20, where God gives us reasoning. Why do we keep these commandments? Why, why must we do this and live this way? What is the main way in which Israel will keep itself separate from these other behaviors? Well, let's read it together. Chapter 22, uh, verse 22 to uh, 26. You shall keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and observe them, 
so that the land to which I bring you to settle in may not vomit you out. You shall not follow the practices of the nation that I am driving out before you, because they did all these things, I abhorred them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God. I have separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, and between the unclean bird and the clean. <clears throat> you shall not bring abomination on yourself, on yourselves by animal or by bird or by anything with which the ground teems, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have separated you from the other peoples to be mine. That's right. The climax of all the holiness talk are the dietary restrictions and the food laws. These food laws are a constant reminder to ancient Israel that their identity was distinct and separate from the Gentiles. Some scholars have pointed out that the animals that God allows for the Israelites to eat are the same animals that God allows for sacrifice. So it's this invitation from God. Come dine at the king's table. Don't eat that other, other, other stuff, other trash. Eat the king's food, right? So what better way for the people to remind themselves of their distinct holiness, their separation from the other nations, but through the way that they ate, through the animals that they consumed and the sacrifices that they did every day. Right? This is a remarkable set of ancient commandments. But what does it mean for Christians today? So I want to end with one basic application point for today. Leviticus shows us that there is a remarkable consistency between the God described in the Old Testament and the God described in the New Testament. Right? Leviticus shows us very clearly that the things that Jesus was concerned about are the same things present in God's law. I used to get this all the time in middle school. My students would be like, how come the God in the Old Testament is so scary and mean, but like the God in the New Testament, like Jesus, he seems pretty cool, like a really chill guy, right? It, that's the thing. They're the same. If you study it, you see that there's, they're the same. There's so much consistency. God's moral imperative in Leviticus is to love our neighbors as ourselves. What was Israel's sin? What were they indicted with? Why do you think God accuses them of being faithless and disobedient? Was it just because they failed at following ritual purity law and offering sacrifices and worshiping the right way? Well, that's part of it, definitely, right? Malachi 1 has some passages about how the priests were offering blind or sick animals at the altar, right? And then there's a couple passages here and there about idolatry. But you know what's a much, much more common rebuke from the prophets? It's Israel's lack of, very specifically, socioeconomic justice. That's what Isaiah says in chapter 5, verse 16. But the Lord of hosts is exalted by justice, and the holy God shows himself holy by righteousness. If you ever have time, try reading through the prophets and count up how many times they mention some form of injustice or oppression by the nobles, the priests, the kings, and the rich, the people in charge at the very top. In fact, here's a short list that I found before I gave up because it's taking too long. Okay? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 23. Chapter 3, 14 through 15. Chapter 10, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 5, 8. Ezekiel chapter 16, 49, 18, 17. 22, 7, 29. Amos chapter 8, 4. Malachi chapter 3, 5. This is just a short list. This is not a mistake. This is not a coincidence. Because Jesus continues the same line of reasoning in his own teachings. Does Jesus teach positive or negative holiness? Does he teach negative holiness? Does he teach on the importance of being separate or distinct? Yes, of course, right? He teaches us about earthly treasures versus eternal ones. He talks about the prayers of the humble versus the prayers of the self-righteous. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. He very specifically calls out people for serving mammon, the god of money. Right? Rather than God, there's all these ways that he's distinguishing himself and his followers from the people around him, the values and ideals from around him. But he speaks a lot more about positive holiness. How much more often does he exhort us to love one another, to serve one another, to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to pray for one another, to not judge, to lay our lives down for each other, to repay evil with good, to watch the way that we speak to one another. He is not coming up with these things out of thin air. Okay? They are all consistent with the character of God from Leviticus. For example, in Luke 21, there's a story of a widow. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. 
There's a story of a widow who gives two small copper coins, right? And Jesus commends her for her offering. And I've heard this passage used so many times to tell people to give more offering. But when we read the passage right before, Luke chapter 20, verses 45 to 47, this is what it says. In the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and who love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. It is in this exact same teaching moment that the story of the widow comes up. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in all she had to live on. This is not a story about how we should give more. This is a story of how an exploitative system was taking advantage of people who were suffering. It's a story of how God's system of justice was being twisted and abused to devour and oppress the poor and the marginalized. And if it weren't clear enough, then verses right after this, right after the the widow's offering, tells the rest of the story, verses 5 through 6. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, as for these things that you see, The days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. The story ends with an indictment, a rebuke against the lavish temple built on the backs of the poor and needy. Jesus correctly identifies this as something that will one day be torn down and dismantled in the name of God's justice. And it doesn't end there. Because the apostles all write extensively about how we are supposed to treat one another in love and compassion and mercy all throughout their letters. In fact, the book of James draws specifically and extensively from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 12 through 8. He writes about loving someone as you love yourself in chapter 2, verse 8. He asks to avoid partiality and favoritism based on wealth. That's in chapter 2, verse 1 and chapter 9, or verse 9. He warns about not defrauding others in chapter 5, verse 4, not making rash oaths in chapter 5, verse 12, and not slandering others in chapter 5, verse 9, and not speaking negatively about other people in chapter 4, verse 11. All of these topics are covered in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 12 through 18. This is because in Leviticus, the motivation given for holiness is because God is holy. This extends to all other parts of holiness. We treat the foreigner with compassion because God treats them with compassion. We love our enemies and forgive them because God loves and forgives them. We are honest in our business dealings because God is honest in his dealings with us. The God that we serve will not tolerate injustice amongst his people because he is a God of justice. And that has not changed since the beginning of time itself. And everything we read about Jesus in the New Testament is built off the foundation of the laws and values expressed in Leviticus. There's an almost supernatural consistency between the two. And this is the mentality that we need to have in our faith as well. For reasons that are unknown to me, God has chosen to primarily reveal himself through the person of Jesus and this ancient historical document. And God has not changed. And if his command to follow his holiness remains the same, then it is up to us to carefully and responsibly understand the character and nature of God. That means that there is a clear goal in our discipleship in Jesus. It is to grow in positive and negative holiness, which means we need to grow in our imitation of God and in our separation and distinctness from the values and ideals of this world. Whether that's through Bible study or through a relationship with other people who can teach you from the life experiences or perspectives, if Christians believe themselves to be God's people, they have a responsibility and a duty to learn more about who God is and let that knowledge shape them. So if your spiritual activities are not growing you in imitation of God's holiness somehow, then what is it for? I don't care how much Bible you read or study. Why do you read and study it? Why? Some of the most unloving, horrible people I know study and read the Bible religiously. 
we as Christians must allow our understanding, our knowledge, our growth in the knowledge of God to also grow us in our holiness. And if we don't, then it just becomes useless self-satisfaction. You're doing it just to feel good about yourself. And we are constantly invited into this process to know and understand the heart of God more and more. As we work together to reflect and imitate God's holiness, as well as practice our separation and distinction from those that are not God's people, from the beginning, it was never about perfection. You don't need to be perfect to do this. God doesn't need you to be exactly the way he wants. There's so much room in Leviticus for you to mess up. You just offer another sacrifice and you try again. It's the same way. The point, the goal is always going to be to grow in holiness, to grow in humility, to grow in love and compassion and mercy. The more that we grow in relationship with God and his people. And every time we learn about him, we must take steps to grow in our holiness. Whether it's through imitating God or from separating ourselves from the world, God's call is the same as Jesus' call. Be holy as I am holy. And I hope and I pray for a ministry and a church that reflects God's holiness to the rest of the world. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and minds eager to understand the depths of your holiness. As we conclude our time in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 20, or through 20, we are reminded of the profound call to holiness that echoes through the ages. Help us, Lord, to grasp the significance of being set apart, to be different and unique as your people. And in reflecting on these commandments, we see the intricate balance of negative and positive holiness, the call to separate ourselves from worldly practices, and at the same time, to actively imitate your character through love and compassion. Open our hearts, Lord, to comprehend the depth of these teachings as we consider the words of Jesus who quoted from Leviticus to call Israel to be holy. May we, too, hear that same call resounding in our lives. Help us, Father, to apply these ancient truths to our modern, modern context, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to show mercy, and to seek justice. Lord, we are grateful for the consistency of your moral imperative from the Old Testament to the New Testament. May we as your followers continue to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, imitating his love, compassion, and righteousness. In our pursuit of holiness, Lord, grant us wisdom and discernment. May our lives be a reflection of your character, and may our actions reveal the depth of your commitment to following you. We pray for a community that radiates your holiness to the world as a light in the darkness. As we part ways, Lord, may the truths we've explored today resonate in our hearts. May we be inspired to seek you more fervently, to understand you more deeply, and to walk in the path of holiness you have set before us. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. So today, uh, we're actually going to be adding something new to our order of worship, and that is an offering song. Okay, so we'll be having an offering song. Um, we'll be having a slide here with a QR code for online giving, and we will have some of our staff uh, with, with uh, baskets if you want to give in, in cash. Um, but yeah, so we're going to sing this offering song together during the offering time. Um, and then afterward, I'll, I'll pray for the offering, and then we'll do our response song.
I bring an offering of worship to King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. pray for the offering. Um, Lord, we ask that you bless our giving, God. Um, I pray, Father, uh, for you to continually work in our hearts, Father. Grow us in compassion and mercy. And may this offering be a symbolic representation of our commitment to following that. So, Lord, uh, we pray that we continue to bring our first fruits before you in this way. May you be blessed by the offering that we have given from our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand for our response song together.
you receive the benediction and may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, please come to the, the food truck hangout or the food court hangout, I think, um, if you can. And uh, see you next week, if not.